Good morning. It's January the 8th. It is a Tuesday morning. Um, I almost made an emergency, well, another video yesterday. I, when my day started off, I was a little bit um, frantic, not quite hyper, but a little bit frantic and a little bit anxious. Nowhere near as bad as it could be, but again, things that I worry about. Um, the rides just weren't coming. I just made enough to be able to quit and be okay yesterday. Uh, came home, relaxed, chilled out, and basically forgot that I was feeling bad at all. So pretty good. Um, set the alarm earlier today. Did get up earlier. Uh, not quite as much sun coming through the window. I think it's actually because it's quite cloudy out. Um, but uh, no, I feel pretty good today. So we're we're off to a good start. Okay, today in history, I decided to do something a little bit different, and I looked up today in science history. A um, couple of interesting things, uh, mostly birthdays. Uh, first, let's go with Alfred Wallace was born on this day in 1823. Alfred Wallace is nowhere near the household name that it should be. We talk about Darwin's theory of evolution. We should call it the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution, although Darwin probably developed it a bit more. Um, Wallace certainly came up with the pretty much the same idea independently. Um, and in fact, it was one of his letters to Darwin uh, because Darwin was known to be swimming in these circles, even though he hasn't published. Wallace sent Darwin a friendly letter saying, hey, I've got this idea. What do you think? And Darwin realized he's got to publish now. Um, he had been kicking the idea around and he didn't publish. Um, and so it was really that prompting that got Darwin to co-write an initial paper with Wallace and then publish on the origin of species on his own um, shortly after that. And that's what became the bestseller and, and all of that. I would like to know a bit more about Alfred Wallace and what he thought of... Uh, Darwin basically getting all of the credit. Also born on this day in 1868 is Frank Dyson. Now, Frank Dyson, um, his name is very popular, especially among sci-fi people, uh, because he's credited with the idea of the Dyson sphere. That is, um, it, when an alien race, or any race, I suppose, it could be us in the future, um, has the ability to harness all of the energy that comes off of its own star, basically by building a structure around it to collect all of the energy. Um, it showed up in a couple of Star Trek episodes. Um, I remember it being talked about when I was a kid. Uh, but one thing I did not know about Frank Dyson, um, he was actually the um, co-lead of the expedition in 1919 to go see the solar eclipse. And what makes this particular eclipse and expedition important is that it is was the first um, verification of Einstein's general relativity. Uh, very short, quick hand in relativity, Einstein says that there is no independent space, there is no independent time. Uh, the two concepts are woven together in space-time, um, and the speed of light is constant. And that brings out a whole bunch of weird and counterintuitive ideas, but the gist of it is that one of the ideas is that um, a gravitational field or a massive object uh, within space-time, such as our sun, could actually bend and affect the path of light. And so what this expedition was doing was taking very careful measurements of the background stars. We know where the stars appear in the night sky, but we don't know if their light bend, bends around the sun's gravity so that when stars are near the sun, that they look like they're in a slightly different spot. An eclipse is a great time to do that because you've got both the sun there and its light being blocked by the moon. And as it turns out, um, under these uh, conditions, we can actually see that the star's position slightly shifts in the sky, thus, and 
shifts in the exact way predicted by general relativity. So that's pretty cool. Um, and finally, it turns out uh, that Stephen Hawking's birthday was today, 1942. Uh, I'm going to give you his title because I just, I think it's a great title. He was the Lucasian professor of maths at Cambridge University. Um, known for many things, certainly known for uh, having Lou Gehrig's disease and surviving it much longer than is usual. Uh, but this affected him greatly, leaving him paralyzed, I think, from the neck down. Um, and with decreasing ability to speak um, until eventually he had to get a um, computer synthesized voice. It was one of the earlier ones. He's well known and um, I think people were kind of supplying it to him so that they would get a bit more uh, famous. But at any rate, um, what I want to talk about with Stephen Hawking today, I mean, he's, he's pretty well known. But one of the things he's known for is making wagers, uh, a scientific wager. Um, a scientific wager is a way for a couple of different scientists to say, I think this, I think that. And these wagers can take a long time to settle because they're waiting on the actual science to come in and settle it. Uh, now, what's interesting to me on this is that I have here at least three of these wagers that Stephen Hawking has made. And it looks like he lost all three, uh, which is actually perfectly fine. Um, it doesn't really look different or back on him, especially when you consider the reasons he made some of the wagers. So the first one we've got is in 1975. He made a, a bet with cosmologist Kip Thorne. Uh, and the bet was if Thorne won, Hawking would buy him a subscription to Penthouse Magazine. And if Thorn and if Hawking won, Thorne would buy him a four-year subscription of Private Eye. I'm assuming that's also a magazine. Uh, so the bet was: Is Cygnus X1 a black hole or not? And in 1975, Hawking said no. Um, Thorne said yes. And in 1990. Hawking acknowledged that he had actually lost the bet, and he said that is why he took the position that he did, was that if black holes didn't exist, much of what his research was telling him would be wrong. Um, and so it would have been a consolation prize, and if he lost the, uh, that he'd have the consolation of winning um, on the other side. Okay. Uh, again, in 1997, Hawking and Thorne this time together made a bet against uh, John Preskill. And this was about the contradiction between Hawking radiation loss of information in black holes. Now there's a lot of stuff going on there and I'm certainly not qualified to unpack it all and I'm not about to try. <clears throat> the bottom line on this is that uh, they're getting into the the muck and mire of uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity combined together. What are the results? What does this mean for a lot of assumptions that we have about the universe and information loss, energy loss, that kind of stuff. Um, so Hawking and Thorne took the side that information must be lost in a black hole. Uh, Preskill uh, took the side that it is not lost. Uh, again, it looks like Hawking has conceded the bet in 2004, uh, which meant that uh, Preskill got the encyclopedia of his choice, and it was the baseball encyclopedia. Thorne himself has not conceded, so apparently that's still going on. And finally, in 2012, Stephen Hawking bet $100 to Gordon Kane, uh, University of Michigan, uh, and he lost that bet, it says here, because of the discovery of the Higgs boson. So I'm guessing he was saying no to the, uh, Hawking was saying no to the Higgs boson. Probably again, more like that 1975. Well, at the very least, if it turns out his work is wrong, he's won the bet. Um, all right. Well, that, uh, 
is about all I would like to do today. I'm trying to see how long this one's been going for. And we just hit the 10 minute mark, so much longer than I had hoped. Anyway, have a great day, guys, and I'll talk to me again later. Bye bye.